Welcome to Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. I mean, who wants to have sex with a guy named Bob? Oh, Bob. <laughs> Just doesn't sound right. Oh, Bob. Bob. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob. 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 With me, as always, is professional film critic Sean Patrick. I am too smart. I am too smart. S-M-R-T. I mean, S-M-A-R-T. And Josh Adams. You goddamn communist heathen, you had best sound off that you love the Virgin Mary. Or I'm going to stomp your guts out. Now, you do love the Virgin Mary, don't you? Visit us at IHateCritics.net. Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our Twitter and Instagram handle is CriticsPod. There you can participate in our top fives, listen to the podcast, read reviews, check out the 88 movies, all the classic, etc., etc., uh, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all your podcatchers. Subscribe to the show, rate, rate and review the show. We'll read any reviews on the air. And then there's Patreon, IHateCritics.net slash Patreon. I learned something new today about Patreon. Everybody's address is already in there. <laughs> <laughs> I actually messaged right. Christina to start with her to get her address. And then all of a sudden I looked down, holy shit. <laughs> this is right there. And here it is. I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, Patreon, I'm finally going to send out those gift boxes this week. Some people have already gotten theirs. Or and at least some people have all of their swag in a box in the front seat of my car okay. and can't wait to get out. But and one person has theirs all the way. Another person's is in Josh's car. <laughs> and then the rest I should have out going out this week. I did talk to someone at work, and the shipping department might just take care of it for me. Awesome. <laughs> I'm lazy. I mean, I got to pay for it, but still. Uh, but yeah, so expect your Patreon stuff coming out soon. And if you want to be a Patreon supporter, I hate critics.net slash Patreon uh, to help support the podcast. Let's jump right into it. Trailers. Uh, since Sean didn't watch it, we'll talk about the curse of. La ya, I say it. The curse of La Llorona. That's how it's pronounced. <laughs> I had to keep watching the last five seconds of the trailer just so I could pronounce it, and then <laughs> yeah. I forgot anyway. Somewhere the, the the Spanish language is very tongue tying. Sometimes this one specifically. Yeah, Sean's gonna hate it. That's oh like. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And he'll have to see it, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. It's April 19th, uh, from producer James Wan, comes the most jump-scary movie you've ever seen. <laughs> James Wan is getting to be like late-period Wes Craven, where he'll just slap his name on anything. Let's keep him in our good graces until Aquaman comes out, shall we? I really would love to give that he movie a chance. directed that, correct? Yes. <laughs> see, there's the... It, it's the... I mean, Guillermo del Toro is guilty of it. Peter Jackson, they just throw their name on stuff, and you sometimes... It, I shouldn't say sometimes. A lot of times it sucks <laughs> when they're not the ones actually doing anything. Sam Raimi's another one. Oh, there's a, somebody recently like ha- did that where they had their name on something. Oh no, it's Mortal Engines. Yeah, because he's got his he, Peter Jackson's name's everywhere, and then nobody knows the name of the director. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's why they do it. <laughs> Hell, when Wolf Creek came out, they didn't even like. It's not like Tarantino or Rodriguez produced it. They just gave a blurb about it, and that was all over the place. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the, this this is one of those, and a large majority of the trailers, I'm sitting in a car, watching the ghost try to roll down the windows, and then the kid stops it and prevents it from rolling and rolls it back up, and I'm just like, you know that if you're just going to break it, and it's not going to roll anymore. Of if course. anybody's ever owned a car from the 80s and 70s. <laughs> right, and it makes you wonder the, the, about the rules of ghosts again. Like, why would you try opening the window of the place where they're sitting at first, do it up front, you know, and then why would you be able to just open one at a time? And then in the trailer, she opens the locks up. It's like, well, hold Start on. there. <laughs> Start there. <laughs> just open the door <laughs> for crying out loud. I don't get it, but it, it doesn't really matter. Um, I see uh, Linda Cardellini is in the film, as well as uh, her name is Sophia, not Vergara, not Coppola, but the one that played the mummy. Butella. Butella, thank you. Yeah, I, I was halfway excited about Linda Cardellini when it started, just because she hasn't really... I really like Freaks and Geeks, and she hasn't really done anything a whole lot since then. And it's nice to see her doing something again. It just kind of sucks that this doesn't look very good. No, it doesn't. Uh, the possession of Hannah Gray- Grace. Now, before you make your judgment on me on this one, I actually think this is a good trailer. 
I kind of figured you would. Why is that? It's a different scenario. It's kind of isolated to one particular spot, and it looks like it's going to be kind of clever and playing around with uh, exorcism, but not in the traditional sense of you've got a priest standing over a bed and someone's contorting. We're talking about a corpse here that's contorting and uh, being trapped in a, in a morgue. All right, at least it's got something of an idea to spring forth from. Plus the girl who's playing the corpse, she was really good in It, and then she's actually really good on that HBO show with Amy Adams. She plays a younger Amy Adams, and they're just like, duh. Oh, she's the corpse. Oh. <laughs> it looked like it from the trailer. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm assuming it is. Yeah, I think it you're right. It looked a lot no, like her. Huh. Uh, but the only thing that bothered me about the trailer was uh, the, the fact that the guy needed to say... You know, if they don't finish the exorcism. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, part of me hopes that's not in the movie. It works for the trailer, but you could totally pull it out of the movie and it would almost make it better. I don't know. But otherwise. I, I thought it was artful. I thought the trailer was showed up the artful side of this film. Uh, there's something to say about exorcism films, though, and really cute names. There's Emily Rose and Hannah Grace. Like, what is it with the really cute sounding names being the ones that are targets of demons that's the only thing that i have to say because i i imagine that somebody writing well, these no. films is... josh clearly demons don't go after white men <laughs> my god you're right man <laughs> a white man could never be taken by a demon <laughs> only those soft-minded women <laughs> pardon me i'm adjusting my monocle <laughs> I dropped some money. Pardon me. <laughs> I don't know. That's the one thing I never understood about demons. Why aren't you taking over The Rock or Vin <coughs> Diesel or 80s era Schwarzenegger? Because like. <laughs> they're not real. <laughs> the Rock is a real person. Vin Diesel is a real person. The demons aren't real. Well, yeah. In but... theory, they like to make up that rule for horror films, though, that the weak and susceptible are the ones that they enter because that's like... <laughs> So you're saying the women are weak? <laughs> no, uh, the children, like, got children. <laughs> but if you're looking at the or Rock or Arnold Schwarzenegger, too, like, right, right, right. You're looking at the big, like, bulky dudes. It's like, why would oh, that make huh. you less susceptible to a demon? <laughs> of course, we don't know these rules. Of course, it's not real. But the the idea of that the it's movies like, have generally set up it's inherent yeah. misogyny. <laughs> I'm into what you're saying. I'm just saying, <laughs> by their rules, it would make oh, sense. Oh, it's definitely, it's it. inherent misogyny on what they think the audience feels. They feel yeah. like the audience will feel sorry <laughs> for a young female more so than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Named <laughs> Hannah Grace. Wow. <laughs> but it was a pretty decent or, trailer. Or, we're all, or they think we're all just dumb enough that uh, we we think that uh, demon, demon possession is based on physical size and mm. gender. Age, <laughs> yeah, uh, and then the destroyer or just destroyer, badass Nicole Kidman looks amazing. Yeah, it took me a until they said but Nicole Kidman. <laughs> I had no idea it was Nicole Kidman. Honestly, that's a uh, it's quite a physical transformation for her in this trailer. I don't necessarily know what it's about but i don't think it really matters uh the trailer was powerful enough to get me interested in this movie i can tell you that uh, the the crowd that i saw this with were just about as agape as as i was in finding out that it was nicole kidman so the crowd i saw this with was fucking awful which oh we'll yeah, to yeah. They're, they're awful too but i had a different awful i think i had four middle-aged ladies behind me uh who do not like horror movies, so they went to the 10 o'clock in the morning showing of Halloween. <laughs> Did not like the trailers. Go? Finally, someone in the audience had to yell at them to stop. <laughs> and they kind of went... It was before the movie started, and then they got better, but they were still annoying. But when the Curse of the Llama movie... Uh, <laughs> Curse of the Llama. <laughs> kind of how it's spelled. That movie I want to see. That's the one I want to see. <laughs> but when that the demon pops up after they can't open the windows and can't unlock the doors and the demon just pops up in the window anyway freaked the hell out of the lady behind me I'm like really? you've <laughs> never seen a movie? I've never since, seen a movie <laughs> since the I had five mimosas this morning <laughs> since the conjuring has come out every movie has had that demon yet. 
They <laughs> serve mimosas at this theater, so. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> But we, I guess we can talk more about these ladies as we talk about Halloween, Indeed. the biggest movie of the week. Oh, yes. Uh, Halloween, uh, the sequel to the 1978 original set 40 years after, negating all that came after the 78 movie. Uh, with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, once again, in the role of Laurie Strode, 40 years later, she's a uh, she's been deeply traumatized. She's a survivalist now and uh, she's got a big collection of guns and traps and so on and she's been praying for the day that Michael Myers would finally be released and finally that day has come because uh, some genius thought it'd be a great idea to put Michael Myers on a bus the day before Halloween <laughs> which that guy's got to get fired uh, but no I know it's just I know there's a spoiler in there that real reveals why that happens but nevertheless uh, the, the day before Halloween, Michael Myers is getting transferred. Naturally, the bus crashes. He kills a bunch of people and escapes, and he's headed for Haddonfield. And, of course, Jamie Lee Curtis is going to be waiting for him when he gets there. Uh, and he's like the shark from Jaws 4, who's like he knows which family he's going after, so he's just psychically drawn <laughs> to the Strodes. <laughs> oh, <that's good. laughs> they can go to the Bahamas. Michael's going to find them. <laughs> Well, yeah, I can just find two random podcasters with this mask at a random gas station <laughs> that happens to have a, a auto body shop next door that they, he can grab his suit. What luck! <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything's coming up, Michael. <laughs> that all said, though, I, I found it to be like a cheesy kind of fun horror movie. You know, you have to obviously the logic's not there because yeah. Uh, but it wasn't really there in the first one, but it just at that time it didn't seem to matter like it does today, which they even reference, you know, <laughs> killings back then versus today. But in terms of a, just a fun little horror action, whatever you want to call it, I, I thought it worked. I'm I'm not a big fan. Uh, I thought this movie was it's a little too cheesy for my taste. Like the the podcasters were especially as much as I enjoyed the way they die because I did enjoy the way they die. Uh, the that that uh, the way they play that that, that uh, those scenes with those gar- characters is basically like they should just call their podcast exposition. Like that's what they're there for in case in case somehow you didn't see the original 1978 movie. We're here to lay that out for you in extraordinarily in extraordinary detail, <laughs> so you know where where this plot is going. Uh, I they just and then they're just making them British and douchey, just so you don't care too much about them because you know they're going to be dead soon. I'm making them podcasters and not real journalists too. <laughs> <laughs> she yells out, investigative journalist, when they go to see Lori. And just to get off on a little podcasting tangent, just for fun, because we can, we're podcasters, we know this. <laughs> this is clearly like a serial type podcast that they're trying to do here with no microphones. They got a, <laughs> and I know that recorder they have, it's right. called an H4N. I have the H6, a little bit better than the H4N. And you still plug microphones into it because you're going to pick up everything in the fucking room, uh, and which you can do, and it'll sound fine. But right. when you're cereal or something like that, where they clearly have three thousand dollars to give to Lori Strode for no reason at all, because they got nothing from her, you think that'd been a little bit of a fight to not give her that money, right? Uh, but that that alone was just like okay, there. <laughs> this was a silly little pet peeve that. Bothered me I, about the No, movie. I thought the same thing when I looked at that recorder and then she's just holding it across the room. I mean, it's a nice recorder, but again, one, they're outside at one point. <laughs> Two, they're, you know, the new Dr. Loomis, whatever his name is, is never facing them when he's talking. He's always yep. looking to the right. Uh, it's it just, and they're walking and he's holding it. You're going to hear every it's, little movement they made. Right. It's just more of the, it's more of the fact that they're just a device to provide exposition. And it just kind of, it just show, shows, shows that too, shows the, the seams way too much of this, uh, uh crappy plot. <laughs> the the device that they were holding and not being familiar with the actual technical aspects of the podcast, even though I'm on one, um, you know exactly what it is. They're looking, I, I 
I kept focusing on it, and at the top of it, it looked like it might have microphones. It does. But then I'm like, this is also maybe a prop to a Star Trek film. It could be a communicator <laughs> based on the way that it looks. So I couldn't tell what was going on. I'm like, this is either super high tech or super shitty. One of the two. It's high tech, and I mean, we could put it in the room between us, and it would get a listenable podcast. Sure. But this sounds better. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now you're an NPR podcast, which is kind of what they were, were trying to be. You're going to have better quality than just putting a mic in the middle yeah. of a room. G- granted, I don't listen to those shows. I'm just assuming they're better than us. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I was the one person who didn't listen to Serial. So. <laughs> you know, uh, about our show, though, I actually like our show as a listener. And not, to, not to toot our own horn here, but I mean, I listened for podcasts for a number of years before I came on here, and I enjoyed it. And, and when I listen to our show, I don't just do it for vanity's sake. I actually enjoy listening to our cadence and whatnot. So, <laughs> screw Serial. Everyone's a critic. <laughs> The serial still exists. Uh, yeah, they're their their second season. I think they're actually going back now to uh, to follow up on the story they did. Yeah, they have a whole bunch, like a huge aisle now, uh, full of like you know corn pops and ah, never mind that uh, one went over here. <laughs> anyway, about the film, uh, <laughs> I actually kind of liked this uh, because of the same reasons that Bob is talking about. It, it doesn't matter per se, but the film itself plays out like a, a nice film. I mean, it's well-rounded if you ignore all of the other things. And my low bar is horror films. And that's a pretty low bar of all of the crap that I've watched. This one was eminently watchable. And in terms of scares, sure, you know kind of what's coming. I mean, he's hiding in the dark spaces somewhere, right? He's got a knife. Everyone's in danger. Everyone can die. Clearly, like the film even alludes to the possibility of killing things that you don't kill, right? <laughs> um, but I, so it made me ignore the logic to this a little bit, ignore all of the things where it was like, you can't crush a human skull like that, even with like a, a very heavy boot. I'm sorry, but bullshit, it's just not going to happen. Especially if you're 60 some odd years old. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, and I, I did find myself wandering into wondering if that character actor was Roddy Serbedjiga or not. Like, I, is it him? Is I it him? thought it's it was him. him. It's not. It's but not. Yeah. I was so, like, I was convinced it was him at first. It didn't have my full attention. But at the same time, at the end of the movie, I realized, oh, my heart's beating a little faster than normal. Uh, there's a little bit of tension going on here. And compared to the rest of this genre, that puts it in the upper echelon for me. I don't watch all of the things that are coming from Europe for 99 cents or whatever i do watch all of the mainstream ones if i can though saying that being said it, it's on my honorable mention for all-time horror films because it wraps that story nicely for me it, maybe too nicely for some i hear fans are annoyed by the film a little bit they're calling it good not great or they are super annoyed with what's going on here I, i'm actually cool with it i, I think that for the most part, if you're going to have a Halloween film and you're going to call it Halloween and not, you're going to ignore all of these other films, well, H40 works out pretty well. Well, p- poking fun at the other films, too. A little digs here, and not digs, I guess, but little yeah. references to the other films here and there. You got to be careful, though. You don't want to. You don't want to mention better movies in your movie, and this one mentions Halloween Three, which is the best of the Halloween movies. <laughs> It's got says, the silver shamrock masks in the movie. That was says awesome. Only was, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do actually the, like Halloween three better than the other ones. But you don't like Halloween, so I that, don't. I that, really don't. That you know takes you out of the majority. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear in, in a couple of places, and I read your review, and I don't remember if you said anything about atmosphere or not. Mm-hmm. But the Ebert.com review, for example, <laughs> talks about how this new film lacks the atmosphere of the original. That you could actually sense that it was fall in the original and what. And I'm like, actually, I disagree with that. This new one did make me feel like. Oh, this is a cool evening. Um, it, the leaves are all over the place. You know, it, it gave me the sense that it was Halloween night. So I, I disagree with the review on on that basis. But I guess on the whole, gosh, it's a success because it, the bar is so low. <laughs> and I don't know. I, I, I just I think the, I prefer the attention to detail in this movie to the original because he doesn't care about any of the details in the original. Uh, he's letting things go left and right, but. Uh, Green at least cares about you know making it uh, making it reasonably uh, believable. 
uh, within the you know, and he's he's got the advantage over Carpenter in that the Carpenter had to try and create a universe, which I don't think he did well enough, in which a Michael Myers character exists. But not just this one universe. at least gets to operate within the the sort of kind of rules that the other Halloween movies have sort of established. But the movies like this just didn't exist either. I mean, I guess Black Christmas was was around and. I, I wouldn't really put Texas Chancel Massacre in this genre. This kind of was the one creating it. So, and when it came out, you know, the logic, it, it didn't matter because it just scared people. It was literally just the boogeyman. He didn't have a name, really. He wasn't the brother. <laughs> you know, everything's all, everybody's all pissed at that, which I think is silly. Mm-hmm. It is really not, because, really not necessary. Let's stop there for a second because... Okay, why would he go looking after, looking for Laurie Strode if he wasn't her? They weren't brother and sister, because she's the one that beat him originally. Both don't make logical sense that he could find them, no matter what. Even if that they, she was the sister, how the hell he's been basically locked up his entire life, minus two nights. Uh, how does he know how to drive? How does he know how to find her? But, you know, <laughs> the logic doesn't change, you right. know? So either way, it doesn't work. And I get what they were going for, but I, to me, it's silly that people were mad that they weren't related. Well, re- of course. Re- I mean, and yeah, that's, that's a, I think you're right. I think that's kind of a silly thing to be upset about. Uh, mostly because he, he doesn't necessarily even, he kind of settles on Lori, but she's also looking for him. Right too, so that I mean, really, and you see him, and I, I, what I what I, I do again, the thing I like about this movie is that Green shows him make two completely random kills right off the bat. He goes into a house that the, the one in the trailer murders with a hammer. Why? Who the fuck knows? He just did it. Next house over, he goes into the next house, walks walks in, slices a girl's throat. Why? No reason. He's just he's a psychopath. Decides not to kill a baby because he's just, he doesn't kill babies, I guess. I mean, it, but he's walking through the houses and he's doing so. That made sense, and the, and the fact that is that Laurie is looking for him, and that does kind of give him a driver to be where she is. Plus, you've got this other character that's a spoiler that I won't give away, but uh, that that is driving him towards her for the for a s- sort of specific means. Yeah, but at the same time, they. He does on his eventually on his own get there, <laughs> which right. is the uh, which they didn't need to do and they still did it anyway. But again, I don't care because the first movie didn't. You know, if you watch it today, you do have to suspend belief more than you do with most other horror movies. But when you do that, I think it works remarkably well. That's the problem I have with the originals that it breaks my suspension of disbelief repeatedly. And I, I will say what I've. <laughs> And I'm going to bring up Rob Zombie just because these two movies made me appreciate what he did. Because when he did it, his remakes, everybody was all mad because he gave him a reason. He, get, you know, and now, now they're upset. What's the reason? There's no reason for. And it's like, come on, just <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> but to to say it though, Rob Zombie's reason was pretty stupid. <laughs> Not really. I, um, I He's would, got a psychic connection to her no, via their no, family. No, 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 no. That you can definitely go back to the the, the show was. that we recorded, and I think we're having the similar conversation here. I remember appreciating the fact that there was a backstory for Michael Myers and gave him a reason. I was like, ah, all right, I like that part of it, and it it kind of uh, settled into typical horror movie tropes, and that's why I was like, oh man, it's not quite complete. But what he did was unique, and the beginning of that film, like if you tie that into these two Halloween films, all of a sudden you've got one complete Halloween film, and that's all good. So I have to give Rob Zombie credit too. That that Halloween is still my favorite of his movies. Like it's the most perhaps conventional film that he's done, but it's also still an art house film in a way. As you explain, I think the second one is an art house film. The first one, I think he got. You know, you had the first half, and then the studio's like, all right, now you got to do it like this. Yeah, yeah. But the second one I like quite a bit, although that is the one that Sean's referring to. But I don't really think it's so much about that as much as it's Lori. The way they – I think that's the best Lori Strode of all of them is Halloween 2 of Rob Zombie's version. I'm, but, I think I think Josh just likes these because uh, Rob Zom- cause it's, cause Michael's mom in the second one is a force ghost. <laughs> she is. Ooh. Not that you say it. <laughs> and she's got a Force Ghost horse. Yeah, white horse. And, and a Force Ghost little boy. Uh, Which and is the, the inner child of Michael, who's dead, apparently. 
And the new Star Wars films have adopted the Halloween font. So I also am down with that. I do have a question, though, because Josh texted me and asked me to ask him, text him immediately when I'm done to get my immediate reaction. Was that just a because you thought I'd like it, so you could compare it to Force Awakens right away. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, um, the Force Awakens thought came like uh, a little bit after seeing the film. What my initial reaction though was like, "Huh, that's way better than I thought it was going to be." And I, you're more of a fan of horror films in right. general, and I wanted. Uh, you to tell me what your initial thought was because I wanted to compare it to mine. You know, uh, is it just me? Am I surprised by the low bar we set for these? Is it just that the crowd was so awful and talking at the wrong times and whatnot? And, and you've got silence, and then you got somebody behind me saying, "Oh, he's he's behind the he's behind the mannequins." It's like seriously, have none of you as adults <laughs> ever seen a horror film before or a film in general? I'm kind of sensing that no, they hadn't. Are they? No. So I don't know. You seem to see it pretty early too. You saw it during the day, 420. right? Four twenty. Yeah, so and I saw it even earlier than that. Uh, that's when the older crowd goes out and sees movies, and I, I don't know. I, I don't think they watch as many. <laughs> oh, man, it, um, it, there might be one more aspect to explore in this one. Shut me up if I'm going down the wrong direction. But you alluded to it in your review, and I think that you may be onto something with this film, and that is. It, it's spoilerific, and so I'm not going to say everything that I would need to to make this um, point come to fruition, but there are certain deaths in this film that no one really rues at all. <laughs> There's no stoppage of the characters to say, like, oh my gosh, my husband's dead. <laughs> best friend or husband or whatever the case may be is, is gone, and no one actually ever stops to say that. And I'm like, uh, okay, well, why? But then I was thinking to myself... What does My Michael Myers represent to these filmmakers? Uh, John Carpenter's involved in this film, of course. You know, he is he guiding David Gordon Green to this idea of what he originally thought when he came up with this movie? Because he, he's got some interesting progressive thoughts in other films, okay? So I'll give him that credit. And in this particular case, at the end of the film, you've got something that's very spoilerific. I, I can't say that. But you've got something that leads me to believe that Michael Myers is representative of something to these filmmakers. And him, ne oh gosh, and at the end, you know, you've got him yeah. doing the thing that he does, which is nothing. <laughs> and, and what does that mean? And, and it could be this whole idea that they're trying to say he's just pure evil. And I'm like, bullshit. There's something to it that we have to figure out on our own. And I think I'm leaning more towards what you were getting at in your review. That, that we're talking about right, the male's misogyny and the immense horrors that they can, can uh, perpetuate upon well, others. There was a great scene earlier in the movie... Where you know how in every other movie you have the jockey, good looking boyfriend and then, and then the fat, dorky, nerdy friend. Yep. You're always kind of feeling bad for that friend. And it's pr kind of our inner mis yep. misogynist in, our, in us that feels bad for the guy, but he's most likely, a lot of times, as big a creep as the guy. He yep. Is, especially <laughs> in 2018. And here they play it out. And I was just like, that's pretty awesome. Yep. Yeah, you're talking about the nice guy thing. Yeah. Where the guy. Seems like a nice guy, and then of course he does everything that the other guy does. I think it's there for a reason, and, and I'll I'll go with that. And I think as a result, these two films together, when you consider the beginning, the middle, and the end, they're saying something as a whole about Michael Myers, and also at the same time, by doing that, talking to their crowd. And John Carpenter, I think, has got some things to say about his crowd, and uh, I think this is the movie to say it in. It was a, it was a it was a nice good shot to the solar plexus. I did enjoy that. Yes, the, the that those that crowd needs to see stuff like that. But uh, that did set up a scene that did kind of drive me nuts with my uh, I don't know my ability to suspend disbelief. Like, what is the what are the little pranks that Michael Myers decides to play? in these movies. I've never understood Michael's, is it a sense of humor that he has? Like, I'll wait for the lights to shut off and then I'll then I'll walk up on him then the lights come on again and there I am and now the lights go off and now I'm gone again and then I'm over here now and now I'm over here. Like, what is he, what is, just get, you've got a knife, just finish it. Just do it already. <laughs> yeah, I I do think this one is less annoying than the other ones. Oh, definitely. Because Especially the first one. 
Well, I, I would say the sequels are even worse than the first one. Because <laughs> at no point is it unbelievable where he gets to. You know, at least he can. <laughs> it's right. not like he's transporting across the room or anything like that. No, like he's he not does transporting, but, he, but he's to- but it but clearly right. he's playing around. He's playing a joke on this kid for whatever reason. Well, he's, when he did the original murders, he's six years old. I would imagine his mind hasn't advanced much past that. So it's like a psychopath as a six-year-old in the body of a 50-year-old. So... Okay, I'm actually kind of okay with that in, in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Uh, gosh, I, I I agree with you, but to a point, I'm okay with how that goes. I, I do think back to your Me Too point. I think that's more David Gordon Green than John Carpenter. I think Carpenter was legit making a boogeyman movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think here this this is more of a 2018, and I. 2018 thing and i do think it was more subtle it wasn't down your throat and you kind of had to notice it uh and to be honest had jamie lee curtis not been talking about it maybe i wouldn't have yeah other than that one scene was pretty obvious uh but i i I liked the way they did it and i thought it was pretty subtle but i do think it's more the more the modern filmmakers uh more so than carpenter because i think all carpenter really brought to this movie was dubstep behind the theme (laughs) the only thing that i would allude to and i can't back this up with like a website source or anything like that but what i've read of carpenter and quotes that he's put out is that he's progressed as a dude like he'll say things that are just like "Ah, this whole nonsense i don't like any of this he doesn't want uh uh the little china film to have a sequel that the rock is going to be in you know he he's (laughs) he's finally yeah he speaks his mind about well normally he's like i don't care pay me (laughs) (laughs) that's usually what john carpenter (laughs) speaks his mind (laughs) so i had a feeling that to him, his originally he wanted to make a boogeyman film, but now oh, like the only definitely. way he would want to get involved is to see the story's natural idea. progression. If yeah. they had an idea that would make it, yeah, yeah I agree completely there. And which would make sense too in leaving behind the other sequels. Yeah, we've talked a whole lot about Halloween. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I think it. You know, I don't like to me the it's. In that horror genre that I guess like it is in, I won't. It's not as good, but it's not that much worse. But it's more of a popcorn kind of fun horror movie rather than a great horror movie. And yeah, that's kind of where I'd throw it. I don't hate it. I just don't... It's not my thing. Well, yeah, especially it, when I don't I don't love the original, I wasn't really looking forward to the sequel. It's Mission Impossible or Fast and the Furious for horror movies, kind sure. of, is what it would, I guess I would say. Or, or as you would Force say... Or The Force Awakens. That, for <laughs> <laughs> I would still say it's a little more Last Jedi or a combination of the two. <laughs> Because they yeah, do change, okay. they do change a little bit and piss people off for whatever reason. <laughs> Stop being pissed off; it doesn't matter. Right, right. <laughs> <sighs> the hate you give. Uh, the hate you give. Yes, this is uh, uh, directed by George Tillman Jr. This is uh, stars Amanda Stenberg, who is uh, playing a character named Star. Uh, Star is uh, two different versions of herself, basically. Uh, She's got a version at home where she lives in this kind of uh, uh, ghetto area, uh, uh, and then she's got this part of her that goes to this uh, high-end Catholic school where she's amongst a lot of white people, and she kind of pretends to herself to fit in. Uh, That all changes when she's out at a party one night, and she meets up with this friend of hers from childhood, they spend an evening together just hanging out, and then the night ends with him being shot by a police officer. And uh, from there, the movie becomes this this uh, very heart-rending story of her deciding what it is that she needs to do. There's a lot of forces aligning against her, uh, the fear of the police, but also there's this drug dealer played by Anthony Mackie who would prefer that people not pay attention to this story because it, it, he's got a reason. I don't want to give that away, but... Um, this movie is very powerful. It's very emotional. Uh, Amanda Stenberg, who's been in some really bad movies like Darkest Minds and and nonsense like that, is still she's a very good actress. And she really pulls this off extraordinarily well. Uh, the movie is, is just gut wrenching. Uh, you've heard the term uh, "thug life." Did you know that it was an acronym? No, I did not. Yeah, it's the hate you give little infants fucks everybody. That's what uh, it's a Tupac thing. Well, I knew he had it tat- tatted across his chest, as he says in a song. But right. uh, I didn't know that it was an acronym that's, at all. That's the acronym. Yeah, the acronym for it, and that's the where this movie gets its title from. Is the hate you give, thug. 
The thug makes sense. The life sure. Part I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically that that African American babies are born into hatred, and they're uh, born into a place of of feeling hatred and fear. And you're wondering why they end up where they do. It's because they end up in a place of hatred and fear. And picking up a gun, becoming a thug, is the only way to so live like, and survive. Fuck everything instead of like exactly fuck everything. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And this movie makes that point very powerfully. It doesn't let anybody off the hook. It, it is very, it's hard on on everyone, <laughs> and uh, it makes it a very. It's it's not an easy movie to watch. It's going to make you squirm in your seat at times because you know you're thinking about yourself. It really puts you in that position of really uh, making sure you're checking your attitudes. Uh, and it doesn't even let. Uh, its own characters off there. It's Common plays a character who's a, a police officer who's also her, her uncle, and he gives her a, a straight up, you know, I'd, when we pull somebody over, we don't know who they are. We don't know uh, whether they have a weapon or not. And, you know, I, I understand that your friend was reaching in there to grab a hairbrush, but I wouldn't have known, and I would have shot him too. And it's like, wow, he said that. <laughs> you're just kind of, you're kind of taken aback, like, yeah, I, I guess I understand a little bit, but at the same time, the movie's very much on the other side of that argument. Uh, it's a, it's a powerful film and really one of the better ones of the year. You say it's on the other side. Does it do a good job of kind of walking the line between the two arguments? Cause that's really, cause I mean, both sides have points. It's, it, it, it's fair, but if, if you're somebody who walks in there with the, that, the, the attitude of all lives matter, you're going to look like an asshole by the end. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you always look like an asshole, but I mean, <laughs> this one's going to really show you exactly why you're an asshole in great detail. Does it do a good job of kind of showing? It sounds like it makes everybody look like an asshole here and there. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of what yeah. the best way to have an argument is to understand both sides of the, the conversation. Mm-hmm. And then the third side, I guess, <laughs> which is the all lives matter side. <laughs> <laughs> the, the trailer was powerful enough to make me want to watch the film as well. And I got that hint from the trailer that they were examining themselves as well as the world so uh, i'm glad to hear that it's palatable and not just that but good well yeah the trailer i thought looked almost you know watchable is the word i was thinking you know an easy kind of a a safe watchable movie that kind of gets its point across it sounds like it's not that it's a little bit more hard-hitting than that which is it's got a a lot more power behind it than you're expecting because it does look like a mainstream feature yeah, hopefully people start to see it. I want to see it really bad. Uh, my wife wouldn't let me. <coughs> she also wouldn't let me watch The Sisters Brothers. <laughs> the Sisters Brothers, yes. This is a, a Western from uh, director Jacques Odiard, who uh, is the director of Rust and Bone and A Prophet, uh, which uh, both, I think, were nominated for Best Foreign Film Oscars. Uh, this is his first American feature. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix and John C. Riley are... Uh, Charlie and Eli's sisters, they're bounty hunters for a guy named the Commodore, played by Rutger Hauer. Though, wait till you see Rutger Hauer's actual <laughs> appearance in the movie. It's pretty funny. Uh, this is not a comedy, though. Not a straight-ahead comedy. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's got some dark humor to it. But this is, a, this is a movie that's about mood and tone and character and the look and the feel. Uh, there's an Alexandre Desplat uh, soundtrack that is incredible. Uh, it's probably the best one of the year so far. That's why Josh needs to see it. Because I hate that guy? No, because you love scores. This is an amazing well, he's score. He's like my least favorite composer, and I've mentioned that on the show. <laughs> but The Shape of Water last year was the best score that I heard last year, so maybe he's turning a corner. Uh, but uh, this is, you know, it's a f- kind of a French Western, if you will. The, kind of a lot of a French attitude to it. We just is, lost uh, Josh again. It's fun. <laughs> it's, a, it's really cool. Uh, I, I, I adore this movie. I love these performances. Uh, John C. Riley's character is so unique and interesting uh he's funny he's uh but he's also the baddest motherfucker like he's a really t- like he could he could be sweet and he can be tender but then at the same time when it comes down to the end of the movie like he's a badass and it's awesome uh and joaquin phoenix's c- character is kind of crazy kind of unpredictable i enjoyed that the thing that's going to drive people nuts, I think, is J- Jake Gyllenhaal's accent. He's putting on a very, he's putting, he's kind of doing like some kind of Nicolas Cage thing where he's decided, okay, my character talks like this. 
<laughs> so is this the movie where like we can no longer call Jill and Hall the best working actor and move it to Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix or something like that? <laughs> well, clearly Joaquin Phoenix picks picks better movies than anybody. I mean, he's the smartest actor working today. This is the third great movie he's been in this year. This year. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, he's just, he's incredible. Uh, but uh, Jacques Audiard is really smart. The, the movie opens on this amazing scene where it's completely pitch black, and the only thing you see are muzzle flashes going back and forth. That's the, all that you see is just these muzzle flashes. It's so cool looking. <laughs> No, the way I, I worked out my day today where I could watch all three movies, because my wife took the kids to, or her parents took the kids to Tanner's, or some orchard or whatever it's called, Pumpkin Patch, and I worked it all out, but at the same time, she wanted me to go grocery shopping. I needed to mow the yard. I had to get I'll said, all these chores in between, and I ended up only seeing Halloween. <laughs> well, my question is, are her legs broken? <laughs> Yeah, it made me think of that argument. She's not in the room right now, so well, no, it, it, yeah, I'm safe. <laughs> well, she was with the kids, but it made me have you know the conversation with about the astronaut's wife yelling at the astronaut. I'm like the podcaster's <laughs> wife yelling at the podcaster. <laughs> I'm not saying anything more, but, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, That's kind of, know, yeah. Although it's really the other way around because I started podcasting after we got married, and I knew she was like this, so I really shouldn't complain <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was my day <laughs> about the the film itself i didn't know that gyllenhaal was in it if i had known that i probably would have tried to sneak out like last night late uh to see that one because anything that he does like i really interested even I, that demolition I actually, movie i actually really like him in the movie i'm just saying that a lot of people couldn't find it like a, a very off-putting sure. sort of way why is he talking like that <laughs> Put Joaquin Phoenix and Gyllenhaal in a movie together, like that's a thing. But the odd pairing of John C. Riley, that's so weird to think that he's in between. These two. I know he's an Oscar winner, but Chicago sucks, so I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't look at the poster for this and not think it's funny. Yes, and the trailer, the the trailer that I saw made it seem like this was like the Brothers Bloom, something mm-hmm. like that. That was Meets meant the to be funny. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny but it's not intending like they like the comedy rises naturally from these characters and, and their interactions and the thing you know charlie's a big drinker so there's a lot of there's some drunk humor in there and uh you know riley's very sweet and there's a little bit of humor in how sweet he is i, I have a feeling this film might suffer from um inaccurate marketing a little bit not just the trailer itself but the title sisters brothers just makes me think comedy and just like the middle-aged people going to see Halloween and they don't know what they're getting into after five mimosas, like this particular one, I wonder if people walking in expecting a comedy and they're going to get a nice little French Western <laughs> film, they'd be disappointed, but I'm, I'm on board. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's just only made $2 million so far. So I think, but I, it, it is more that art house movie. So it's cool that it even came here. Mm-hmm. Back I wasn't here. expecting it. Yeah, your Halloween comment, the ladies behind me I was talking about. Yeah. Can we just go watch Goosebumps instead? (laughs) Those words came out of their mouth, too. (sighs) No matter which film you want to see, Movie Pass doesn't have any of them, so it doesn't really matter. (laughs) They they had the hate you give today, but that Uh, was, it didn't have anything Friday or Saturday. It was ridiculous. So we are done with Movie Pass. Yeah, screw that. You guys are paying full price for us to go to the movies now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear, legitimate, and universally recognized undisputed classic. Our undisputed classic this week is Dawn of the Dead, 1978. Yes, uh, Dawn of the Dead, George Romero, the follow-up to uh, Night of the Living Dead, uh, is... Uh, a genius movie. Uh, this is probably this is probably the best zombie movie. I think. Oh, I mean, Night of the Living Dead is pretty classic itself, but they're just so far apart. It's hard to yeah. You know. It's hard to compare them because the, 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 even the, though they're sequels, right? <laughs> the the milieus are so different. Uh, you've got the a tiny cabin in the woods in the middle of nowhere, and then you've got a mall. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I love it. it's like it, the, the juxtaposition is wonderful actually when you get down to it. This is a, a really exciting movie from the very opening. The chaos of this TV station, people yelling and screaming, people running into the frame. The most unprofessional TV crew ever. <laughs> You're not a you're not an you're not an audience, guys. You're you're on the crew. There was a zombie outbreak. I know, I in f- fairness, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad anybody showed up to work that day. I, I'd be the only one at the radio station. <laughs> yeah, but that news media back in the day. <laughs> I mean, you saw what they did with the hurricane stuff, pretending they were in a hurricane. And <laughs> <laughs> fake news. That's fake news. Oh God. <laughs> There ain't no zombies. I ain't never seen no zombies. This is fake news. The news media is convincing you that there's zombies out there. The closest sharp object just gouged my eyes out with it. Ears. Ears. <laughs> Ears. 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 Uh, the one thing I found remarkable about it, though, is like, like this is before the Reagan era. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that it came out. And, but it's very much... I mean, obviously, it, the Reagan era starts. You know, there's there's a lead up to it, right? But it, it was just kind of like, wow, they really did <laughs> predict where this is going to get way worse than it is. And you know, we talk about Texas Chancel Mac- Massacre. That's like the death of the hippie dream, right? What do they say? Dawn of the Dead's like the baby boomers giving up. <laughs> that kind of the movie <laughs> that signifies still that. still doing it forty years later. <laughs> I actually was thinking about making this part of like this. Uh, I've been thinking about a book, and with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but also, and, and this will sound weird, but Nashville is in this book, and then this movie because they're both kind of similar, and at least they're all similar in terms of the the ideals being given up by the baby boomers, the the, the way they look at things. Like this movie is basically the baby boomers going, "Fuck it, we'll just buy everything." <laughs> like it just, we just want money now. We don't care anymore. <laughs> Yeah, the the film itself, uh, I enjoy this very much. This is the second time I've seen it this week, and the chaos at the beginning. I know the 2004 version isn't our classic this week, and there's not much of a reason to mention it here on the show, except for the fact that the reason I like it so much, um, the first half of the film, you really get that idea of chaos. Like if nothing else, they captured the chaos very well. And this one opens up like that. And you really need to pay attention to it. The film whips you in a frenzy, even if you don't know what's going on per se, even if it's a little um, different than, than other films and how they generally start or whatnot, you're discombobulated. And I think that puts you right there with the characters as they end up at the mall. And throughout this mall time i mean i'm kind of looking around and saying oh that's really neat i it looks like the malls of my young youth you know of course it does it's 1978 but uh what this does though is those allusions to anything it's saying about society they're they're there okay you can see them if you if you want to but also as a horror film this works pretty damn well uh the kills are very interesting um the the flesh eating it's visceral. It's there. Um, the the first bite that a zombie takes out of a woman's sh- collarbone, roughly, I'm like, ha, that looks pretty damn good. I mean, it's not, you know, like it's a like piece Cameron, of turkey. Cameron Diaz's shoulder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cameron, zombie Cameron Diaz's shoulder. Yeah. But Dawn of the Dead is is also incredibly stylistic and and, and, and watchable. Like, uh, Romero isn't the best filmmaker. I think... Even big fans of him would say, yeah, his films don't always uh, flow really well, right? Um, it's it's low-budget stuff, I understand. It, it's not a conventional film. Night of the Living Dead, maybe the most unconventional film that I've seen that everyone <laughs> loves so much, right? But uh, it, it just works really... You know, do you notice the credits had Dario Argento yeah. Yeah. involved heavily here? And I never made that connection myself, but it makes sense. They're both horror film veterans uh the fact that he helped work on the music it seems as well as the script i wonder how much of an influence went into this film as a result and not just romero having seen suspiria and and knowing a little bit about argento i can see a little bit of the gore you know uh alluding to that because night of the living dead it's gory in parts but it's not like 
blood and guts everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And this one's definitely upping the ante a bit, and and then it continues to get that way throughout Romero's zombie films. But this is definitely the pinnacle of all of his zombie films. And for me, I I have a hard time calling Zack Snyder's version better than this, but I think it's just the the filmmaking, the 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 updated scenery, um, the cinematography of that one, the music, the acting is just that much better that I prefer it as a, as a more populist fan I, I, version. It's definitely less homework, you know, yeah. the Zack mm-hmm. Snyder version is. But at the same time, I, I this like you said, it's watchable. Uh, it, it is a little over long, but I, I don't really know what I'd cut out of it per se. Uh, but I don't know. I like my, my I'll bad mouth my wife one more time on here. Why not? <laughs> I said, can we watch Dawn of the Dead? Because she never watches the old movies or our classics. She hates watching movies for a second time or even her first time, but it's, it's old. She wants to see something new all the time. She's like, is that the one with Godsmack in it? And I was like, Disturb, but no, and the other one. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, no, no thanks. I was like, all right. Well, it's on YouTube. <laughs> and I put it up on a huge TV <laughs> on YouTube, and it it worked though. I mean, it they had a charm about it because of how low budget mm-hmm. it was and back in the day. And I mean, was Tom Savini involved in this? Yeah, one? Yes, he was. he was. Not just in the makeup and effects department, He's but he it. is in it as part of the gang that comes in and and sees that they have a functioning helicopter and whatnot, and they're going to use this and transport themselves out of the situation. It just adds another element of chaos to it. Uh, I'll add one more thing about this involving the zombies themselves. Most zombie films, it's like, oh, they're walking way too slow, or you got the Danny Boyle ridiculousness and where they're sprinting across London, right? Um, and in this particular case, everything, regardless of how the zombies move, it's filmed in such a way where you feel danger regardless of where they're at, where they're about to close a door and keep them out and lock it or whatnot, or, you know, oh, does all they, all they need is a bite and then he's done for. Like, that tension is there most of the time throughout this film. And you think of a mall like... We'll just get on the second level, man, and you're going to be fine. But no, they have to. What's that? Escalators. (laughs) Yeah, they could have blocked the escalator. You know, whatever the case may be. Uh, It just works really well. In most zombie films or or the, the Walking Dead TV show, I'm kind of like annoyed by how the filmmakers or the creators choose to make the zombies move. And in this one, not for a second was I annoyed with an in fact felt danger. That's all I'm going to ask for these movies to do is give me that sense of doom that, that being in the position of the characters and Romero does that really well in this one. And it's interesting. You talk about other zombie movies or even other horror movies. The, how you get you watch them for so many years and some of the victims sort of become inhuman especially like there was a movement towards the 90s and early 2000s to make all the victims of bad guys just into the people you just do not care about at all like i I want that guy dead he's so annoying and this is a movie where the characters are like you do not take my dead person because that's my dead person and he was a person at one point you can't have him and especially that early scene in the uh, apartment building like this guy i know he's dead but he's mine you can't have him and i i it, it it kind of blew me away like why do you care so much and then i'm like thinking about oh yeah these were human beings at one point <laughs> and i think that that's such a such an interesting thing to go back to now and it's, and I, I i hope that horror movies do begin swinging back that way where we like uh, start thinking about these characters again and caring about the actual people who are in who might die. Yeah, in the the there's a particular scene in which a character dies and is covered with a blanket, and there's that obvious tension of when is he going to reanimate? And this film likes to have some patience with that moment and some silence with the music to let that tension build to the point where the, when the blanket does move. It's a little unsettling. Uh, most of the time, the zombie films that I watch, it's more of like a snap, like they're flying the blanket off or whatever, or or something has like a guttural growl or whatnot. This film seems more natural. Like uh, that's probably how it would go if if zombies were were real. I, I'm just impressed by Romero, at least with this film for sure. And how detail oriented it was. It, it, you know, a low budget. This is like maybe the most accomplished low budget film I've seen. I 
yeah, I do think this is kind of the pinnacle of all zombie movies. Uh, and if we're going to go to horror movies, I'm still going to take Chainsaw Massacre over it by a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I do think the, you know, the death of a hippie dream thing is kind of, it's more subtle. Here it's in your face and you just, you can't miss it. Uh, so I, I will take that over this, but I still, I really like this movie a lot. Uh, one of the great horror movies of all time. And I, I do like the remake too. I just, I guess the social relevance isn't the same. It's, it's there, but it's, it's just copying it. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> really. Were they fast zombies in the remake? I can't remember. No, um, just a, perhaps a little more aggressive and, and the, the power of the zombies is something of rotting flesh and, and wild eyes versus this one, which is, Almost a blue hue right. to the zombies, in fact. So probably more like uh, it probably makes them more menacing, which thus makes you think that they're faster. But I don't remember them sprinting I at all. Don't. It's more of like a, I a fast seen it. drag. I remember <laughs> liking it, but I haven't seen it since the theater way back when. Mm-hmm. Put your top five. Who's your top five? Uh, our top five this week is horror movies. We're going to give that another shot to see if our list changed at all. I know some of them have. Uh, let's start with cousin jeff he said his is pretty predictable number five night of the living dead four halloween three friday the 13th the final chapter two psycho and one black christmas with a billion honorable mentions uh someday i'll have to do a list of hidden gems he said uh ian Britt had number five misery four house of a thousand corpses three shocker two nightmare on elm street one texas chancellor massacre uh, Uncle Jeff, in no particular order, Halloween H2O, The Babadook, Carrie, Hereditary, Halloween 78. Uh, Josh, want to do yours? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that you liked my list. <laughs> I mean, it I don't... makes me feel, feel good that you weren't annoyed by my list again, because most of my top fives... I only have uh, one on it that's on mine, but they're good yeah, movies. Yeah. So. Uh, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre is my number five. Four is The Babadook. Uh, three is The Descent. Two, The Thing. And one is Poltergeist. Twelve honorable mentions. My list is based on... Uh, films in order of how i liked them they happen to be in the horror genre uh, i didn't include alien here that's more science fiction you know how i work with subgenres. so and scary films i would the thing that's still hit, the thing has still scared me the most and that would be number one yeah and i mean i left sounds of the lambs off mine too i mean as much as it, it is a horror movie but I, I it's just too obvious i want to get other movies in there uh, I had number five, The Strangers, and largely because it was such a great theatrical experience for The Devil's Rejects. This is actually probably my number one, but I'm aware that there are more deserving movies. <laughs> uh, three, Hereditary. Uh, this would be higher, too, but it really does boggle my mind. And this is not a shot at Josh. This is a lot of people, but the people that just checked out at the end and just like, I, I don't get that, but yeah. uh, that seems to be the majority of people to the exorcist because it should be there i guess and then number one obviously texas chance massacre great podcasting experience along with great movie uh number five the descent for me number four is carnival of souls because uh it was this extraordinary discovery for me to see that uh people made horror films in the 50s like real horror movies in the 50s and it's such a psychological horror on top of everything else such a an incredibly well-made movie. Uh, number three would be The Mummy with Boris Karloff. Uh, number two is Hereditary. Number one, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Number, number, number 18 in 1988. Squeezed and pulled and hurt my neck in 1988. Squeezed and pulled and hurt your neck in 1988. 1988. Six films released. I'll start with two that I didn't watch. I actually didn't get to any 88 films this week, but I have seen one before that I'll lay into here in just a bit. But the two perhaps most English films that I've ever heard of, I'll start with Without a Clue. It's it's a Sherlock Holmes film starring Michael Caine and Ben Kingsley as Holmes and Watson. 
And that sounds like an interesting pairing. I would probably enjoy the film, but it just it's, it's quite British sounding. And I don't know if either of you have seen it. No. Okay. I didn't even know it existed. You know, <laughs> Holmes is one of those things where everyone's done one way, shape, or form. There's so many versions of it. It's like Robin Hood in a way. And also, a f- <laughs> there was a movie about a month ago we talked about. It was something about dust, and it had Kristen Scott Thomas in it. I was like, oh my God, that's the most English sounding movie of all time. Like, that's Holmes homework right there and instead we have a movie called little dorrit <laughs> it stars derek Jacobi, the most thespian british actor of all time and alec guinness and probably one of the last few roles that he had uh, the 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 synopsis for this one is just oh, i can't even read it to you guys on the show because it's just so british and I like a lot of British films, and and I don't want to lambast whole cultures based on a film, okay? But like, if I hear about a French film, I'm like, oh, I just, the, the sound just bothers me, okay? It's nothing to do with French people, okay? It's just the language. And with English stuff, you guys have slightly backed me on this in the past, where it just seems drab. A film called Little Dorrit, I'm never going to watch this. It could be the greatest film of all time. I just, I'm predisposed to hate it. Have you seen it? <laughs> no, no. Okay, good. Good for you. Well, sir Alec Guinness and Sir Derek Jacoby, just saying. So you know. Hey, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Called Save the Queen. <laughs> Number three, uh, Messenger of Death is a Charles Bronson movie. Um, he's post-death wish. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of death involved. Cool name. Yeah. <laughs> Messenger of Death. And then you put Charles Bronson next to it. Right. I've got a message for you. <laughs> Death. <laughs> this next one is the one that I really wanted to watch this week because of Ken Russell's involvement. Yes. The Lair of the White Worm stars <laughs> Hugh Grant. Now, uh, the gift that I got for, I think it was you, Sean, last uh-huh. year, Gothic, right. is a Ken Russell film, and you were talking about how weird it was. <laughs> and I remember the, the cover to that and thinking, I still, I still want to see Gothic, and eventually I'm sure I'll get to it. Uh, this one sounds fascinating. You've guys seen it? I want it's to. It's been, been a while. The, the synopsis is when an archaeologist uncovers a strange skull in a foreign land, the residents of a nearby town begin to disappear, leading to further unexplainable occurrences. That's a standard synopsis for a film, but if you know anything about Ken, Ken Russell, Russell. <laughs> then you're going to be slightly intrigued beyond that. And I still haven't seen a Ken Russell film, but you guys have talked about him enough. That I'm, I'm not intrigued. sure I have either, but I, I know the devils that I read a lot about. I don't think you can really get the actual actually, version of it. It's actually available now on Filmstruck. Is it yeah, the actual thing? I think though? it is because they did edit it's, a lot it's of Criterion. it. Criterion. I don't know because it's been on Amazon before. You just couldn't. They cut out a bunch of it. Layer of the White Worm, I believe, is streaming on Amazon, and and I always say like I really want to get it to it this week. If I can, this one intrigues me enough that I do want to. We're going to do a streaming challenge next week. I think I'll watch that one. <laughs> oh. Fantastic! I have Filmstruck. Filmstruck's like the favorite, my favorite thing in the world. Because it has all the criterions on them. Yeah, exactly. Well, Hulu used to have all the criterions on them, but now you got another streaming service. <laughs> anyway. It's only uh, going to get worse. Anyway, continue. Uh, a Vietnam film called Bat 21, starring Gene Hackman and Danny Glover. Um, it's a Vietnam War movie about an aircraft shot down over enemy territory, and an operation to rescue ensues. Um, I remember the title of this one and thinking, oh, bats, horror films. No, it has nothing to do <laughs> See, with that. I, didn't, I thought, because <laughs> Batman had come out a year later, and I would go through the... <laughs> I'm like, Dad, can we rent this? It's got the dude from Lethal Weapon and Bats in it. So yeah, I'm thinking Batman yeah. and no. See, that's the kind of story I like hearing. What were our thoughts as 10, 11-year-olds? <sighs> and last but definitely least, uh, Mystic Pizza. I hate this movie so much. And mainly, you know, expectation versus delivery is a problem for film sometimes. Julia Roberts became a star after this film. Um, Annabeth Gish is really the star of this movie. Uh, she doesn't leave much of an impression for me, but Julia Roberts does. And knowing her later, coming to this one, buying it sight unseen in 1999-2000 uh, on VHS at the local college Walmart, taking it back to the dorms, popping it into the VHS and saying, huh? oh my God, this is awful. <laughs> It is a bunch of people that get together at a pizza place in Mystic, Pennsylvania, and and they go through life's troubles together. (laughs) Okay, it wouldn't be so shitty if they didn't 
constantly refer to how the pizza place really brings them together. Okay. No pizza place ever brings anybody together. Okay. They want to get out of there. They want to go drink with their buddies when they're not working and forcing this nasty pizza down their throat. And the woman that plays the, uh, the maid in two and a half men, I can't remember the actress's name, but she is the proprietor of this pizza place. And she's constantly reminding her girls, like, but, you know, you've still got Mystic Pizza for you. And it just, it's so awkward and so blatantly trying to yank tears out of you that you'll be annoyed 15 minutes into this movie. But it lasts much longer than that. <laughs> it's so shitty. It's Thank such a you. terrible movie. It's so bad. It is unwatchable, honestly. It is a, it's an insufferable movie filled with insufferable characters. Yeah, and Julia Roberts' uh, name and um, visage being on the front of all of the video jackets is a misnomer. She's Total definitely lie. a supporting character. <laughs> it's Oh, it's so awful. Please don't watch it. But still, Mystic I mean, <laughs> in fairness, uh, people who like me who weren't stupid enough to go and buy it and watch it. Yes, no that offense. was a stupid move. It's painfully obvious this is a chick flick and nothing more than a chick flick based on the cover and the <laughs> title of the movie and everything in it. And I disagree with the chick flick designation. I think it's like a coming of age type film. Um, like any male coming of age film, right? You could have Stand By Me and you're watching Stand By Me. That's a coming of age film. Fine. But it's decent slash good, right? This the male's in it. <laughs> Uh, we are both propping ourselves Michael up Myers and digging our holes me. in the same podcast. <laughs> Someone's going to light this basement on fire. We're going to be trapped. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, Mystic Pizza was hated by my, at the time, fiance, who was very excited about Julia Roberts and this film. This she, is, too, hated it. This is like a, not not some, I mean, it's, 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 there are elements of chick flick, but honestly, this is more like a really, like a, like a sub-basement version of the big chill. <laughs> oh, another shitty movie. Oh, wow. I like the big show. Yeah, I remember I was talking about it uh, some time ago. Yeah, that movie's awful. Imagine like the, the fifth multiplicity version of the big chill. You get Mystic Pizza. <laughs> Which one's multiplicity, though? <laughs> We're heading to a dark place. <laughs> I like that movie, too. <laughs> Next week. Is a completely throwaway week. Uh, we have Indivisible and Hunter Killer. Ooh. I don't know what either one of those stars, Gerard Butler and Gary Oldman. I don't know which one. Hunter Killer. <laughs> but better if we didn't know. And but. Indivisible is, uh, I believe it's a Kirk Cameron produced. Oh, so we might not even movie. talk about it on oh. the podcast. <laughs> I was hoping it was going to be a math movie or something at least. <laughs> it's more like a Pledge of Allegiance movie. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because of that, our classic is Two Towers. Uh, we have to get to it to get to The Return of the King, and at some point we had to do it, and Josh kept picking have other to. movies. Have well, to. In order to get to the third one, we gotta get to this one, so. Yeah. That's what I meant by have to. I guess my Stars subscription will finally pay off. <laughs> if, if you watch it through Stars, cool, but just so you know, guys, I'm happy to deliver it I'm to you. I'm not watching your six-hour version. <laughs> I bought right, it that's on fair. Blu-ray for three bucks. <laughs> All three of them, I'm good. All right, that's fair. <laughs> Library book fair? Or <laughs> <laughs> Kind there of. always seems to be like three versions, like all of them missing a disc <laughs> at the know. library book fair. This was just basically a resale shop. <laughs> But I remember my son watched the first one with me, and he liked it, but it was like, but there's the more? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, that's the argument from everyone, but uh, that's okay. It's a good film. I think you might like The Two Towers the I've most seen of The all Two of Towers. Them. I've oh. seen all of them. I just oh. was bored. I guess I didn't finish Return of the King. I got most of the way through it. Well, The Return of the King didn't really finish Return of the King either, so <laughs> don't... <laughs> Well, I, technically, it finished it like three times, but yeah, that, you did a better version of the joke that I was trying to do <laughs> again. <laughs> and then our top five may change throughout the week. Well, actually, we'll we'll give you two options now, and then if someone dies, that'll be the top five. <laughs> but currently, it is either say five nice things about Gerard Butler or, or Gary Oldman top five. <laughs> I kind of like the random ones, but uh -huh. we'll see. If someone dies, that'll definitely take over. But Yeah, so top five Gene Hackman, maybe. 
Maybe. I'll stand Patrick Gene Stewart. Hackman. It's very old. We're, we're guessing who's going to die this week. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> who's your pick? <laughs> well, see, when you have surprise moments like that or whatever, I'm thinking you're thinking of the worst things to happen to younger Molly Lohan. Individuals. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That is a sparse filmography to try and choose from. Mean Girls. <laughs> Freaky Friday? I Parent guess. Trap. Parent Ooh. Trap. Is there more? <laughs> Her version of Herbie isn't terrible. Herbie fully loaded? <laughs> you can do the worst movie of all time, or in the top five worst movies of all time. She's in one of them. The Canyons? Yeah. But yeah, that's what you get to look forward to next week. We'll probably, unless like mid '90s or something like that, a bunch of movies come this week. We'll probably throw in a streaming challenge as well. Uh, but that is our show. I want to thank our Patreon supporters. Up here, our key grip levels: Jason Bryant and Charlie Messing. <laughs> Our character actors, Cousin Jeff, Christina Cato, and Josh Paul. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Our special effects level, Sarah Ward and Corey from Ivy Envy. May the force be with you. Our associate producer is Jason from New Mexico. Everybody has to eat shaving cream once in a while. And our movie stars are Uncle Jeff and Dave Seavers. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! If you want to be a Patreon supporter, head over to IHateCritics.net slash Patreon. It's the best way to support the podcast. And like I said, I do have all your addresses. If your address on Patreon has changed, please go in there and look and update it. Because I'm going to send... Or send me a message ASAP let me know it's wrong. Uh, But I'm going to start sending stuff out this week. Uh, and so hopefully we'll start to get our new merchandise. And if you, there's things you want, you know, let us know. I'm not the most graphically sound person in the world. So, uh, we may need help making shirts and stuff, but cause I haven't been able to make a nice shirt. <laughs> That's been my biggest problem. Uh, but if you have any ideas, let me know. I uh, will definitely look into it. If you want to be a Patreon supporter again, I hate critics.net slash Patreon. And then, obviously, rate and review the show, subscribe to us wherever you listen to us, and we will see you next week. That ought to do it. Thanks very much, Ray. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone can have. And we'll never, ever, 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 ever leave each other. We're the best three friends that anybody could have. I mean, the three best friends that anybody could have. The friends that three. Dawn of the Dead or the Deer Hunter? Um, it's been a while since I've seen the Deer Hunter, and I just saw Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go Dawn of the Dead just out of recency bias. I will too for reasons, I'll like actual the, reasons. I'll go with the Deer Hunter for actual reasons. Uh, other than, I mean, yes, yeah, so it's that long wedding scene that they could totally cut out. But Dawn of the Dead or the Descendants? <sighs> Hmm. That's how low Deer Hunter and Donald and Descendants are on our list. <laughs> <laughs> um, descendants, actually. Yeah, the Descendants is a, a, a top one hundred one for me. I go Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead or Fearing Loathing in Las Vegas. That's not hard. Dawn of the Dead. Agreed. Dawn of the Dead or Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> Dawn of the Dead. Agreed. Yeah. Dawn of the Dead or The Exorcist? Dawn of the Dead. The Exorcist. The Exorcist. Dawn of the Dead or Nightmare Before Christmas? Dawn of the Dead. Agreed? Yep. Dawn of the Dead or Death Proof? Death Proof. Dawn of the Dead. I think I'm going to go with Dawn of the Dead as much as I like Death Proof. Dawn of the Dead or Walk the Line? Dawn of the Dead. Yep. Agreed. I agree. Dawn of the da- Dead or Borat? Dawn of the Dad. <laughs> That's where you get up, you scratch your ass, <laughs> shave, fart a couple times before you reach the toilet. Starring Tim Allen. <laughs> oh, oh no, I'm not interested in it. <laughs> you described it, Tim Allen. Yeah, I did. Dawn of the Dead.
Wait, what was it? Oh, it was Borat. Borat. Uh, Borat, actually. I like Borat a lot, but I'm going to go with Dawn of the Dead just because it's one of those. I think I like Borat better, but Dawn of the Dead's better. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the Exorcist is up again. I don't know why. Oh, it didn't like our consistency there. Uh, 248 between The Exorcist and Borat. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey at 246 with <laughs> Superman at 250. <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is 241. <laughs> I didn't even know we ever picked of that. I, yeah, that's baffling how that got there. My guess is we didn't. I uh, do like Rudolph, but... So this is your fault. Probably. <laughs> oh, yeah. No doubt. Uh, you can run through a couple more unless you guys got to go. Good. The Girl Next Door or The Da Vinci Code? Oof. <laughs> Fishing with Gandhi. Fishing with Gandhi. <laughs> well, okay. I like the girl, the girl next, next door. The girl next door is good enough, I guess. Um, I cannot remember that actress's Eliza name. Eliza Cuthbert or yeah, something Alicia like that. Yeah, Elijah Cuthbert. Uh, yeah, so girl next door. Last Action Hero or Beverly Hills Cop 2? Be- Be- Beverly Hills Cop 2. Agreed. Yeah. Pleasantville or Silent Hill? I'll actually go Silent Hill. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Pleasantville anyway, but Silent Hill is so underrated. I haven't seen Silent Hill, but uh, neither I have I. Likely gone Pleasantville. We will just reset it. <laughs> Ant Man or East of Eden? East of Eden. I haven't seen East of Eden. <laughs> neither have I. We did a James Dean movie. It was the Rebel Without a Cause. So, yeah, I haven't seen East of Eden. Refresh. Someday we'll have to bring that one to the show. Absolutely. Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, or the Rocky Horror Picture Show? Rocky Horror Picture Show. Pirates of the Caribbean. It sounds like this is a bad experience with Rocky Horror, or just hate it that much? You never went to a screening, have you? I haven't gone to a screening. I understand why it's popular. Totally fine. Not my cup of tea. I don't like the music. And I probably haven't seen Pirates of the Caribbean and the Curse of the Black Pearl, so I'll just refresh again. This is the refresh edition. Whale Rider or The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly? Um, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, just barely. Whale Rider is a hell of a movie. I'm going to agree with that statement. Okay. <laughs> Spider-Man or Starship Troopers? Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Most things except Starship Troopers. Why that became a cult classic, I will never understand. Total Recall or Rush Hour? 90, Total Recall, Schwarzenegger one. Total Recall, I guess. Rush Hour. I have no passion either way. (laughs) I'll go Rush Hour because Josh seems to have more passion than I do towards (laughs) Total Recall. Because I really don't have an opinion. (laughs) Wanted or the birds? The birds. The birds. I'm just going to refresh. Hercules or G.I. Joe? I don't care. <laughs> Jesus Christ, give me something I care about. <laughs> like, okay, 310 to Yuma or Shrek the Third? <laughs> 310 to Yuma. Yes, obviously. <laughs> Changeling or Scott Pilgrim versus the world? Scott Pilgrim. Scott Pilgrim. Yep. V for Vendetta or Crocodile Dundee? V for Vendetta. Crocodile Dundee. Go with you, Josh. I'm not a fan of V for Vendetta. Mary Poppins or Star Wars Attack of the Clones? Uh, Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. The Graduate or Starsky and Hutch? (laughs) Starsky and Hutch. (laughs) (laughs) The Graduate's Uh, a douchebag movie, and... Fucking Dustin Hoffman irritates the fuck out of me. Yeah, yeah, but I get why he's like that, and I think that I like The Graduate. Um, I don't own it, but you know, the sound soundtrack is magnificent. I have that one at home. <laughs> it does have a better soundtrack. <laughs> Thumb and Louise or Misery? Uh, Thumb and Louise. Misery, barely. I'm going, me too. I'm going misery. <laughs> Rambo or the hunch? Come on, give me something different. 
The Prestige or Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring? The Prestige. Lord of the Rings? It's the one Christopher Nolan movie I really like. Not the one, but Terminator 2 or Holy Grail? Mm-hmm. Terminator Josh 2. Josh is looking at his list. <laughs> <laughs> I know Terminator 2 is in the 30s. Monty Python's in the teens. So, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Wow. Monty Python wins. Uh, Turned me into a neat. Interview with the Vampire or the Evil Dead 81? Evil Dead. Interview with the Vampire. Evil Dead. As good as it gets or Apocalypto? As good as it gets. Apocalypto. We do need to bring as good as it gets to the show. I'm going to go as good as it gets. Yeah, yeah, the problem, of course, is that Helen Hunt and Jack Nicholson don't really make movies that much <laughs> anymore, and neither does James L. Brooks, for that matter. So Greg so. Kinnear, we're relying on you. <laughs> right. And Cuba Gooding makes something that goes VOD. So. <laughs> Cruel Intentions or Dogma? Dogma. Dogma. Really? Yeah. Uh, Cruel so. Intentions is bad. Would you ever consider rewatching Dogma? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Of Kevin absolutely. Smith? Um and Cruel Intentions, I've seen multiple versions of. It's it's the same story as right. Dangerous Liaisons, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. And uh, speaking of Kevin Smith movies, Zach and Mary, there's a lot of Dawn of the Dead references. <laughs> oh, is it really? <laughs> okay. You know, I'm glad that you said that because that's still sitting at Love my it. place as part of the double disc with Clerks 2. Still haven't seen it. And as a light like break from horror stuff this weekend until the vast abyss that we're about to wander into this week, that would probably be a nice middle ground. And Jason Mewes goes full frontal. <laughs> That's what I've always wanted. <laughs> Jason Mewes penis to brighten your day. <laughs> That's our show. 